Amen. If you have your Bible, we're just going to go straight into the Word of God. Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, 11, 12, 13, and 16. So Luke chapter 13, verse 10 and 11 and down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up and when Jesus saw her he called her to him and said to her woman you are loosed from your infirmity and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God somebody say amen, amen. and verse 16 so ought not this woman being daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound think of it for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath somebody say praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I want to speak today on a topic called breakthrough to the bent breakthrough to those who are bent and this will come from the story that we've just read from gospel of Luke chapter 13 where there was a woman who had a spirit and she was bent but before we talk about this woman we read in verse 10 of this chapter it said that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue now wouldn't you want to have Jesus as your guest speaker now it's good to to listen to T.D. Jakes it's good to listen to Joel Osteen it's good to listen to uh, prophet T.B. Joshua it's good to listen to uh, you know awesome preachers but it's completely another when you come to a church and your guest speaker is Jesus Christ but it's interesting that they allowed Jesus to teach but they were deeply offended when Jesus started to touch they loved Jesus behind the pulpit but they did not want Jesus to do anything else beyond talking and my Jesus is not just a talking Jesus our Jesus is a doing Jesus and after he's done with the sermon see the preachers usually the good preachers the best preachers many times when we're done with the sermon we finish with prayer but Jesus doesn't wait until he gets done with the sermon he starts doing stuff in the middle of his sermon and he knows it can offend people it can cause him to lose his favor with some people but he still is in the business of teaching and touching we need Jesus who does both the talking and the touching can somebody say amen. amen as he was teaching the Bible says this woman she had a problem and this story is really about four different D's it's about a demon it's about a daughter it's about a dysfunction and it's about a deliverer I just gave you four points this story is really about a demon this teaches us one thing about demons is the demons have one mission but different methods this story teaches us that that this demon was a spirit of infirmity before we learn something about her problem we learn that there was an evil spirit sent on a mission to bring sickness into her life now we understand as Christians that there is a slight difference between the devil and the demons many Christians say well the devil's been attacking me the devil's been attacking me but in actuality it's not really the devil it's most likely demons the devil attacked Adam in the, in the garden we see the devil attacked Job we see the devil attacked Jesus but we see in most of the cases in the Bible it was demons who were doing the dirty work not the devil the devil's kingdom is made out of demons who have different ranks different names different functions and even different powers and they run his dirty work and so most of us are actually not attacked by the devil personally we are attacked directly by demons and so is this woman it was not the devil who gave her the sickness but it was a demon whose core assignment was to bring a sickness into her life when everybody begins to say that the devil attacked me the devil attacked me it almost seems like the devil is everywhere but he's not what makes the devil not God is that he cannot be everywhere at the same time that means if, he, if he's attacking you he can't be attacking me therefore the devil is not attacking everybody the demons are helping him in that job that's why Jesus says the devil has fallen from heaven I saw him like lightning behold I give you authority over evil spirits 
we are commanded to cast out demons why because it's not just the devil we have a conflict with we have a conflict with his agents whom the scripture calls demons unclean spirits familiar spirits wicked spirits and so many other names the scripture gives us an example of different evil spirits for example in here we see an evil spirit named infirmity in proverbs we see a demon called pride that comes before the fall we see in book of acts a spirit of divination we see a spirit of heaviness we see in timothy a spirit of fear we see a spirit of jealousy we see spirit of lying we see spirit of bondage we see spirit of drunkenness spirit of antichrist so there's all kinds of different spirits and they all have different functions but when one same mission kill steal and destroy though they operate differently though they function differently yet they all go to the same goal to destroy and to kill in this woman's life the demon didn't bring her drugs he didn't bring her lying he didn't bring her fear he didn't bring her heaviness but he was responsible for bringing her a sickness now sometimes it's easy to read something from the bible and and to just kind of read it and think well this happened a long time ago how true that happened we don't know whether it was, ex it was ex as an exaggeration and maybe people added things to it to make it suitable for our generation but we here at the Good News Church we understand that demons are real and we understand not that only they are real but we know that demons are not just simply puffy little clouds floating in the world but they are real entities attacking real people and causing real harm in people's lives half of the church said amen and the rest of the people keep listening and we have prayer lines once a month where we see that I think more vividly than any other time and I just have a short clip just to remind you of that these things are real and they are real in people's lives today and so I just want you to watch just a short clip of three deliverances and this is just a small expert of what was taking place in these people's lives who are you? In Jesus' name, answer. I'm a giant man. What have you done to him? Destroyed his life. I destroyed his career. Destroyed destroy? his marriage. How did you destroy his marriage? I caused confusion. How did you destroy I his... I lies. What else did you do to his marriage? Oh, I made everything all work. I stole every money he made. What have you done to her body? <laughs> I need This is a different sick. case. <laughs> she's not thin, she's foolish. <laughs> Who is responsible for the sickness and the joblessness? Me, I am her husband. Yes. You are her husband? Yes. So this demon Sir? identifies himself Welcome as her is husband. Name? My name is Sagai. And we and see this is her real husband. Next to you. My wife. She's your wife? Yes, sir. Who is this man? I don't care about him. I don't know him. She says she doesn't know you. Well, she's my wife. How did you enter him? Childhood. Molestation. You entered through molestation. What else have you done to his life? What have you done to his health? And what have you done to his finances? I've broken it. You've broken it. I've scattered it. You scattered it. I've moved it. You moved it. What else did it you do? You cannot succeed. What else did you do? I destroyed his life, his marriage, his ministry. His career and if he did not stop or destroy so we see it's pretty obvious that different spirits different functions we see the first gentleman who came from uh, Washington DC an evil spirit he called himself by a strong man and he does did a lot of damage in his life and when this young man was freed we saw that few months later the things that were in stagnation in his life they were completely received breakthrough Eventually he went to school with us, he received his green card and everything just literally fell into place. We see this lady, an evil spirit that was tormenting her life, came in the form of her husband. He, she had a natural, real husband, but this spiritual husband that took a place of her husband, tormenting her dreams, not letting her have a job and everything. And this evil spirit eventually when it was expelled, this woman's life was changed. I had to be an opportunity to be on a trip with her first time when that evil spirit was tormenting her life and I gotta tell you when people are tormented by the devil they torment other people she was pain in the butt 
she was the most difficult person to deal with I mean she was walking and I was had to either pretend I was on the phone or something because she was very very difficult case everybody knew so when she came for the prayer line I mean I knew I'm like Lord help us because this evil spirit needs to be gone completely and it was gone we went again to the trip with now with her husband she's a completely different woman and her husband testified she said she's not the same she said she she's good now she's working and everything is going well because this is what happens when an evil spirit was tormenting someone's life can somebody say amen and so we see also in the person's life Christian he was from California and you know evil spirit entered into his life through all kinds of uh, spells and so many other witchcraft things that he dumbled into and when the evil spirit was exposed we saw that a lot of challenges and difficulties that he thought they were probably normal but the evil spirit was behind it and that he also entered through molestation and by the grace of God we believe this young man was free we stay in contact with him he is also participating in some of the things that we're doing as a home group and so um from the feedback we are receiving from him that he's doing really good he's serving Jesus alive happy and really excited and so we are really happy to be a part of these people's lives to see the devil is real and demons have different names different functions different ranks and different powers but only one mission steal kill and destroy there is not one demon that is saved sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost even the demons who have a little bit of power, they don't have more holiness. All of them are wicked and all of them are bad. And we see this woman, evil spirit is attacking her life and bringing a sickness. Now the second thing I want you to notice from this story is not a demon only, but I want you to notice that she is a daughter of Abraham. Now not directly a daughter from Abraham because Abraham we don't see that he had daughters. We know that Abraham had one son and then had many other children. But she was a descendant in a covenant with God. An Orthodox Jew. A person who worshipped God on the Sabbath. People who lived by the ceremony and by the, by the rules of the Old Testament. And we see that the evil spirit is attacking a woman who is in a commitment to God. This is what we must understand. The first part that I mentioned that demons do bad things, nobody has a problem with that. Everybody say yes sir, amen. But the second part where we see a person who is committed to God and who gets attacked by the devil, this is the part where most of denominations and Christian beliefs go into a problem. We go into a conflict. Because most people believe that as a Christian you cannot come under an influence of the devil. And so there's mainly two views. If you are a Christian, you cannot be attacked or demonized or oppressed by the devil. If you are oppressed by the devil, it means you are not a real Christian. And then there is another category of people who believe that because now when Jesus lives in you, the devil cannot live in you. Therefore, if you have the devil living in you, Jesus is not in you. Or if Jesus lives in you, the devil cannot live in you. And we have a problem. Because this woman was committed to God. She lived in God's house. And we see the enemy attacking her life. We see the enemy having an attack on her life. The problem we have I think as Christians is sometimes we don't understand demonized, word demon possession. Most of our definition of what be, being demon possessed comes from Hollywood, not the Bible. When we think of word being possessed by the devil, we immediately think of horror movies, vampires or zombies. None of us have a point of reference for being demon possessed that comes from the Bible. It all comes from Hollywood movies. And in Hollywood movies, every case where somebody was demonized, they are mental, they are crazy, stuff comes out of their mouth, people tie them to beds and the priest comes with a crucifix and keeps shoving into their mouth, spraying them with all water and everything. And that is our definition of somebody being possessed by the devil. Did I say right? In the Bible being possessed by the devil doesn't actually mean that you are out of control. It means actually demonized. And that's why most of the Christians who cast out demons, they believe that being possessed actually the word that we use is when the enemy oppresses you. Not necessarily that the devil possesses you and you're tied to your bed and you're completely out of the control and saliva comes out of your mouth. That is not what this woman was. She was the church goer who was oppressed and who was attacked by the enemy while still living in her life in commitment to God. People always have a problem. How could Jesus live in me and the devil live in me? It's very simple. God lives on earth and so is the devil. 
It's very simple. You are made of spirit, soul and body. Jesus lives in your spirit but your soul is still being sanctified your soul is your soul is still being changed by God and your body one day will be resurrected so it will be saved in the future if a Christian believes that if Jesus lives in me and therefore Satan cannot have no access to my life then they have to also agree that if Jesus lives in you a Christian cannot be depressed a Christian cannot be discouraged and a Christian cannot have fear a Christian cannot have doubt and a Christian cannot have disappointment a Christian cannot make mistakes and a Christian cannot think sinful thoughts because how could Jesus live there if you're thinking those thoughts then we come to the conclusion that nobody is really saved and we're all going to hell at the end of the day but the devil is a liar that is not true Jesus can live in your spirit and your soul is still can be bound up by some demons or by some things. That's why we have Jesus in our heart so that he can help us to fight those things. We didn't have Jesus just because and he removed every single thing. It's like this, if you have a rental and you live on one floor and in a basement you have tenants, you're the landlord. You live in the spirit. They all live in your soul. There's different rooms and you can have different tenants. You can have tenants from different countries. You can have tenants that speak different language, drive different cars, work at different places and they can still live in your house while you are the boss. But because you're the boss, you have the authority to cast some people out. <laughs> And because Jesus lives in your spirit, he has the power to drive demons out. And when he does not live in your spirit, you honestly, you don't have the right and the legal authority to cast nothing out. You can provoke them, but you can't genuinely be free without Jesus. Because Jesus is the landlord and he casts demons out who occupy certain parts of our life. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so we are very happy that Jesus lives in us. Amen. amen. And because now it is true that we shouldn't have demons. It is true that we shouldn't have curses. It is true we shouldn't have discouragement, fear, disappointment or depression. That is the ideal. But the reality is none of us are really there. If we would be there, apostles would not write to us in their epistles telling us don't give place to the devil. If it's impossible to give place to the devil, why should we be warned not to do so? If Jesus lives in us and there is no way we can invite the enemy in, why would Paul or Peter or those brothers would ever tell us to not to give place to the enemy if we can't even have the possibility to do that? She was a daughter and the demon was attacking her life. But if we go a little bit further and we see that not only there was a, an evil spirit attacking her life and not only that she was a daughter, but we also learned something about her dysfunction. We learn something about that the demons brought into her life. And this is what we learn is that demons can bind one area with leaving other areas untouched. We see this woman is a religious woman. We see this woman, she committed to God. And one area of her life is bound by Satan. This area is a part of her health. She still walks, she still can see, she still can hear and she can speak. But her back, her neck, this area was hijacked by the devil. Now I want you to listen very carefully. That when Satan bound her health in a spiritual world, her health became bent in the natural world. So she became bent naturally as a result of being bound spiritually. When she was bound spiritually, it affected her natural life to that degree where it could no longer be straight. It was bent. And she tried to fight against it in her own power, but she couldn't do it. And I want you to know one thing, that whatever Satan binds, he eventually will bend. Whatever the enemy locks in the spiritual world, in the natural world, that area cannot remain straight. It has to have a bend bent toward one way some people you know it's a bent toward alcohol for others it's a bent toward attracting losers who constantly leaves you always hurt and broken and cheat on you for some people it's bent toward smoking for others it's bent toward pornography or bent toward lying or taking things in the store without paying and whatever is bound in the spiritual usually gets bent in the natural 
Can somebody say amen? So her natural bend was not an accident. It was the result that in a spiritual world that area was bound. And Jesus is such a brilliant teacher because Jesus doesn't just help this woman but Jesus gives us a lesson and he demonstrates to us that there could be areas that are bent in the natural that you cannot make them straight until first you go into the spiritual and you make them loose because when things get loose in the spiritual they can get straight in the natural and therefore our challenge today is not just simply how to learn to make ourselves straight but our challenge today is to how to work with Jesus to make ourselves loose so that we can be straight because this woman was bent something happens when you are bent you're not bad you're just bound sometimes when you see a person who has a bent towards something we quickly give them a label that they're bad but Jesus in here and we know this was a physical situation and I'm applying the issue of bent sometimes into the moral issues but the issue is not always that they are bad those who are bent but they're bound and it's important to make the distinction it's important not to label every single person as well you're bad you're bad you're bad when we open our eyes to the spiritual world we might see that it's not necessarily that they're bad it makes them look bad it makes them act bad it makes them think bad it makes them associate with bad but maybe perhaps they're bound when you are bent you're not necessarily bad just bound when you are bent something bible says that she could not by no means raise herself up she wasn't bent because well she just had this issue of always walking low she wasn't bent because she was lazy she was bent because every effort she put in to make her life straight failed it proved abortive she tried she tried many times she's not lazy she's not stupid she's not just a woman who has problem in her health she is a woman who is bent naturally because spiritually she happens to be bound and nobody saw that I don't think maybe she even saw that except one person who saw that and that name is Jesus Christ and he's the best teacher and not only he teaches but he touches and he delivers people for the glory of God can somebody say amen sometimes we are bent because we are bound but there are times when we are bent because it's been not only our problem but it's been the problem that our parents had perhaps our grandparents aunt and auntie have a similar bent towards similar direction and it's easy when we're discouraged tired or something happens in our life we tend to bend when everything is good we seem to everything is fine we seem to like we're walking somewhat straight but the moment pressure comes we bend in the same direction in the bible bible uses different words to describe men's disobedience toward god one of the words that we all know and it's used only in a religious setting in our culture is the word sin word sin means to miss the mark it was in, in the Greek it was the same thing as if you were going to a, a, pl a flight and you missed a flight you would use that instead of saying I missed a flight you would say I, I sinned a flight so it was not a religious word it was simply meant you tried but failed you tried but you didn't try hard enough and you didn't reach it another word for disobedience to God in the Bible is iniquity now word iniquity is a little bit different than the word sin because word iniquity carries a idea of being twisted crooked perverted perverse and bent bent means when you have a certain bent not just an act but it's a repeated act it's your habit it's now your addiction it's now your it's your way of doing things it's the way smiths do it 
It's the way Robinson's doing. Well, it's the way we do it. It's the way we Russians do it. It's, it's the Mexican thing, or it's a Russian thing, or, it, or it's American thing. Or it, now it's become our band. It's no longer just your personal, but now it becomes a family band. Or everybody has a band on that. Now it's pretty normal. We see that in the scripture. Where our father Abraham was a mighty man of God of faith. But he had a bend toward lying. It was not a big bend, but it was a bend. He almost jeopardized his promise. We see his son rising up and his son has exactly the same bend to the same degree. Even the stories repeated themselves. They lied not about their cattle and their house and the promise. They lied about their women. He lied about the woman. His son lies about the woman. And then we see his third son, grandson Jacob, he has a similar bend toward lying. He lies to his dad about his brother. You think it stops there? Jacob's children lie to their own dad Jacob about their son and their brother Joseph saying he's dead when he's not. We see four generations who are mighty men of God who have a bend toward lying. And so this is not just one person who has somehow, you know, the demon attacked them. But this is already a generational and when a person dies, the demon jumps on the other person. And when the person dies, jumps on the other person and keeps jumping and jumping and jumping. And somebody, until somebody gets sick and tired and says, you know, get off of my back. And Joseph did that. Joseph had many situations to lie, cheat and do many things and Joseph says, you know what? I know this looks so easy and I know this is the time for this demon to pass on to me. But he says, you know what? That's not gonna be like that. And this stopped and we don't see bent on lying in Joseph's kids. We don't see bent on lying after that because somebody rose up and says, you know what? This has to stop and I can be the one who will stop that. We see, yes, let's put our hands together for Jesus. We see in Exodus that God says he will visit the iniquity of the fathers to the children, grandchildren up to fourth generations. We see in Lamentations where it says that our fathers have sinned but we bear the iniquity of our fathers. We see in Psalms David says that in iniquity I was conceived. We see in Deuteronomy where God presents a plan to Israel. He says, I offer to you blessing and cursing. He says, choose life. Choose blessing so that you and your children will live. What God was saying is whichever way you're going to go, your kids will most likely be bent in exactly the same way. But with the amazing verse in Isaiah 53, it says, Jesus was bruised for our transgressions, but he was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions but bruised for our iniquities. Jesus did not only die to deliver me from the penalty of sin. Jesus died to deliver me from the power of sin. Jesus died to deliver me the inner bruise. So the things that are bent in my family, the things that go through blood, through genes. Jesus says, I have a better blood, my blood. And if you come under it, you can be free and you can be straight because you are under better blood. And the blood that's been passed on from our forefathers. Can somebody say amen? You can be free because of his blood. You know, actually, I've heard a study where scientists did a study upon people who grow up in particular homes and environments and they found out that when kids grow up in a family where parents are alcoholics they're not just using you know once in a while they drink but they're they abuse alcohol they found out that that child who grows up in that home is 10 times more likely to abuse alcohol in their life because they grow up like that and they found out that these these tendencies, proclivities, they actually travel in your genes. This is not just something well, a learned behavior that you observe in the house. You see them drink, you see like, well, that's the way of life. This is not just that, but it's also in your genes. But another thing that I heard in a study that they found out is not only that they are in your genes, but when you are born, that these genes can be activated or remain dormant. Certain genes you cannot deactivate like the color of your eyes, the color of your hair and so many other genes. They are simply will be activated no matter how much you want to change it unless you're Michael Jackson you can afford the surgery. But otherwise you cannot deactivate them. But there is genes like laziness where everybody has diabetes or everybody doesn't care about their weight or everybody constantly cuts corners or everybody doesn't want to go to school. Everybody doesn't want to stay with their husband and life and make the marriage work. These genes can lay dormant and they can be deactivated. Just like with an iPhone. If you buy a new iPhone from the store 
the new phone comes to you unactivated only after you activate it that it works I want to tell you something today you are not responsible for what gets passed on to you but you are responsible for what you activate if your parents have grew up and done something maybe grandparents may maybe nobody in the family has done right and there is this bend and you say I feel this bend in my life I want to encourage you today you are not responsible for what passed on to you but you are responsible for what you choose to activate in your life you can put that gene back to sleep and say you know what you have to go back where you came from and you can activate a new gene in your life the gene of God the gene of the fruit of the spirit the gene of the promises of God and be who God wants you to be can somebody say amen let's put our hands together for Jesus you know the amazing part about this woman is this wonderful woman though she had a, a demon attacking her and though she was a daughter of Abraham and though her dysfunction was that she was bent in a certain way physically and we said that sometimes it's what iniquity looks like spiritually when people have a certain bent towards certain behavior certain attitude certain action or a certain habit is constantly bent and sometimes they don't want to other times they set up certain goals and plans and resolutions to break it and it seems like like this woman when I try to lift it up I can't do it and Jesus decodes life for us and he tells us that if you are bent physically you are probably bound spiritually and we also see from the Old Testament that if you are bent physically you have to ask around and check is there anybody else in my family that is bent if they are this is not a time for you to record a message to them and say you know what officially I want to tell you something you're all cursed and I'm cursed because of you and so you all need to pay me some money and help me to get out of this problem because if it wouldn't be for you I wouldn't have this problem that is not what we should do ask Eve she tried that when she blamed her sin on Satan and that didn't work and it's not gonna work with you this woman realized I am bound I am bent but I'm gonna still go to church every Saturday my back is bound but my feet are free I'm gonna use my feet and she in her dysfunction still functioned she still walked even though she was bent she could have sat at home and said I'm a woman I'm disgusted people are repulsive people are repelled people are people don't look at me normal when I walk people leave nobody loves me nobody likes me and that ruler in that synagogue he doesn't even care about me because when I got healed he was mad I mean you know that's a bad pastor <laughs> he's mad when you're healed imagine coming to a synagogue where you are not loved where you are not appreciated I mean we have people who get their feelings hurt because a pastor doesn't shake their hand and somebody takes their spot they did not notice me and it's already fifth week in a row and many times and that becomes a reason to say I'm not coming to that synagogue again this woman came in every single Saturday ugly she was not beautiful she was bent a crooked woman but she was there you must understand one thing is that no matter what challenges you are facing that you cannot overcome you cannot allow your challenges to change your relationship with God because your challenges will change your relationship with God will change your challenges when you continue in your commitment to God that will eventually bring to a place where those challenges will find a solution in your life I'm not sure this woman talked to the devil but I know that her actions did when she woke up in the morning on Saturday and did not feel like going to church and she looked in the mirror and she saw herself being so unattractive saw herself being so well not so well pleasing and with her actions this is what she said to the devil she said devil you like my back and you don't want to leave it I don't have enough power to get you out but I'm gonna drag you to church 
you torment my life wait until you meet Messiah and I am gonna drag you she was an evangelist but she wasn't bringing souls she was bringing demons to church the demons that cling to her back and she said you know what because see the demons once they come on you they want you to stay at home they want to torment you at home but you have to give them some of their own medicine and you gotta say to that demon even if you don't say verbally say it with your action when you don't feel like drag that demon to church dip it in worship dip it in prayer dip it into the word of God and that's exactly what she did she dragged that demon to church every Saturday and I think after 18 years most of us look say oh how did she endure 18 years my question is how did that devil endure 18 years how did that demon put up with the scriptures every single Saturday how did he put up with that woman who was so persistent and the devil's worst day came on a Saturday when on the, some regular Saturday he was dragged once again to church and oh no he did not want to be there he kept telling her nobody likes you here look at the person he's looking at you funny he's looking at you funny he's taking pictures of you look at you they don't even care about you and the devil kept talking and the woman kept doing her thing she kept doing her thing until the Messiah came and when the Messiah met the devil the devil was sorry I gotta tell you something when you have a problem in your life don't let your problem hold you back drag your problem crawl if you need to by bring it to church bring it to a prayer line bring it to worship bring it to the Word of God when many times when people commit sin or when people fall into something that has happened habitually they feel completely unworthy to go back into the Word of God they feel like I can't pray I can't go to prayer again. I can't fast. What's what's the point? I blew it. That's the devil lying to you. Do what this woman did. This woman could have said, I can't do this. Drag the devil to the Bible and let him die and let him suffer. Let him be tormented in the presence of God's fire if you don't he will torment you when you stay close yourself at home and say I feel down I'm discouraged I'm depressed life is hard oh nobody loves me and understands me I'm just gonna sit here and watch sitcom that's when the demons did not only take your back they also took your feet they took your mouth they took your ears they took your eyes and they took everything from you don't give them more than they what they took drag them to church somebody say amen I want you to notice that God is not going to let Satan carry your guilt like Jesus carried your sin on the Calvary. Most of us think that as long as Satan is responsible for what I did, somehow God is going to take the blame from my life and put it on Satan. And I in return am going to be free. This only happened once and it wasn't Satan who carried the guilt. It was Jesus but Satan is not going to pay for our sins even if he was behind them he's not responsible we are responsible and therefore we should not let the enemy not just take our back but also not give him our feet can somebody say amen we see that this woman not only she was attacked by the demon not only that she was a daughter of God daughter of Abraham and that dysfunction that came into her life in the form of being bent because she was bound but we also see that she meets the deliverer and deliverer is no other than Jesus Christ she doesn't meet him because she signed up for his prayer meeting his prayer line she doesn't meet him because she went to be prayed by him she didn't meet him because she reached and touched him while he was preaching she didn't meet him because she climbed on the tree like Zacchaeus so she can see him. She didn't even look for him probably. He was teaching like some other rabbis teaching on Saturday and actually it was Jesus who met her. The Bible says as Jesus is teaching and in verse 11 it says that verse 12 it says and when Jesus saw her. See men don't like to look at women who are like her. But Jesus is a different man. He looks at you not only when you look good, he looks at you when everybody looks away from you. And Jesus saw her. 
what did he see? I think he saw three things. I think Jesus saw a demon. Jesus saw a daughter. And Jesus saw dysfunction. Jesus is the only person who can see three things in one person. Everybody in our life can see only one. They can see your dysfunction. They see your bent. But they don't see the demon behind and they don't see that inside of a bent person is a daughter. But Jesus doesn't see only dysfunction. He sees a demon and he also sees a daughter. My Jesus has an objective perspective. He can see beyond the pain. He can see beyond your situation. He can see beyond how you look. He can see beyond how and what you did. He can see beyond that, beyond what you did to why you did it and what happened to you 18 years ago that caused you to do what you did last night. Jesus is able to see you for who you really are. Jesus is able to see that which you yourself can see because after a while when you have a crippled situation you develop your own identity and you say yes I am a bent woman yes I am a bent and a bad woman I am that person and you begin to take on an identity of your dysfunction but Jesus saw her Jesus sees you for who you are Jesus sees why you are who you are. Jesus says what you can be if he only touches you. Jesus sees you. The best place to come to when you are struggling is to come to Jesus and not to be afraid of his eyes because his eyes will not see only what your mama sees and what your daddy sees when you get in trouble. God's eyes will see you and not only your mistake, your destiny and any demons that are attacking your life. Can somebody say amen? And Jesus gives his word and Jesus goes into the attack mode and the Bible says that he attacks the demon. He doesn't attack the woman. He doesn't call her by names. He doesn't say, you crooked woman. He calls her. When he called her to himself, he said, woman, be loosed from your infirmity. He said, woman, and he goes into the spiritual world, a world she does not know much about, a world that the rest of the synagogue only read about, but he steps in there and sends his word and that word loses something in the spiritual world and in the spiritual woman, the world, this woman becomes free, but she's still bent. And then Jesus comes to the natural world and he touches her back and the Bible says when he touched her immediately she became straight. I want to tell you something that the Word of God it attacks the devil. The Word of God it heals our dysfunction and the Word of God restores our identity. Can somebody say amen? The Word of God attacks the devil. In the counseling world they usually tell you if you have a conflict with your spouse this is what you should do you should get together and both of you try to attack the issue not the person and if you have been married or if you are married and you ever try to do that especially when you're mad it's very difficult but when you are really mad and you try to not attack the person but attack the issue then the person stops defending themselves and they support you in attacking the issue even if the issue is their their issue but if you separate the issue from the person you can solve the issue and not hurt the person but Jesus goes even further Jesus doesn't attack the dysfunction he attacks the spirit behind the issue See the Word of God is not so you can cut your spouse and say, God said submit to me. God said love me, cook my food, do this. The Word of God is so you bind the devil without hurting the person. The Word of God is to reaffirm the person's identity, heal the person's pain and break the hand of the devil. But most of us, we break the person's identity, wreck and damage the issue by trying to solve it and leave the devil untouched. Jesus does not heal the woman first. Jesus breaks the power and the grip of Satan. He attacks the devil. He touches the damage 
that was caused by the devil whom he removed. We must recognize when a person receives freedom, they don't necessarily get everything in their life fixed. There are still damages left from the curse or a demon. And that's why the Word of God is so important to heal those damages, to touch those hurting areas of your life so you can be made straight and glorify the name of God. But Jesus doesn't end there. The woman is still there praising God. And he talks to the ruler and he said to the ruler, this woman is a daughter of Abraham. What would happen if you would hear that? Jesus said that about you. Oh, that would encourage your faith. You would print that and put that under your refrigerator. That would be a ringtone on your phone. On a good day, on a bad day, you will look at yourself and you say, did you know Jesus said, I'm a daughter. Guess of who? Not Moses. Our father Abraham. Because the word of God is to break the hold of the devil. Heal the damages caused by him and reaffirm my identity. Without God's word, there is no deliverance. Without God's word, devils will not flee. Without God's word, you cannot be healed. And without God's word, your identity will be based on what you did, what people have done, what you said, what they have said, she have said, what I think, what I feel, what the media said, what this have said, how I look, what I accomplished, what degrees I have, and how much money I get. Your identity will come like this up and down, up and down. But when you have the Word of God, you'll be like John the Baptist. In the peak of revival, they came to him and they said, who are you? And John did not say, I am John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah and the son of Elizabeth. He said, I am who God says I am. I am a voice, like prophet Isaiah said. And when John the Baptist was locked up in jail, John the Baptist was still the same. I am the voice that was sent to declare the Word of God. When your identity is anchored not in your accomplishments or your mistakes, but in solely in the Word of God, you will weather through the storm. And when you're feeling down, you will still be standing. When you're feeling up, you will still be standing. Why? Because the Word of God never passes. Graduations, diplomas, fame, everything passes. It comes and it goes. People rave at you when you're on the top and they forget about you the moment you hit the bottom. But God's Word that created the world it never ever passes when you anchor yourself in it you will be stable amen jesus through his word and by his spirit affects every area of our life the word of god attacks the demon heals the dysfunction and restores the daughter i want you to make god's word today a standard in your life this message for me came as a result of dealing with one young man who we took on a trip with us. There was few, but there was one particular man that we took on the trip with us to the Skoan and he had a certain dysfunction in his life that he, we prayed for, I prayed for, and I was convinced, he was convinced, all of us were convinced if he will go to the Skoan, he had the faith that his dysfunction will be over. And I believe truly it was over. He was delivered by the glory of God. When he arrived back to the place where he lived before, I reached him afterwards. And I was so happy for what God did in his life. Until a few days later, I sort of lost the contact with him for, for a while. And he reached me back and he said that, you know, the same dysfunction that I was free from, I fell back into. I wasn't surprised. I wasn't shocked. And I did not doubt his deliverance. But because Jesus delivered you in the spiritual world, that does not mean you still don't need His touch and His teaching in the natural. The woman was delivered, but she was still bent until Jesus approached and came to her. The, the, and I told this young man, and I'm telling this to us and to myself, that deliverance and prayer line and being prayed with Prophet T.B. Joshua, something shifts in your spiritual world. But that doesn't necessarily change everything right away. The Word of God must go deeper inside of your system, inside of your life. That's why in school and what they say is you have to make God's Word a standard for your life. Not a book you hear the pastor preach on Sunday, but a standard. Let it heal the damages demons created. And even after that, you still need the Word of God so you can know who you are. 
so that you don't refer to yourself by what you've done and you don't refer to yourself by how you're doing but what he's saying about your life can somebody say amen somebody say amen I want to challenge you today make God's word a standard for your life from deliverance to his healing to his restoration in every process God's word is the bedrock and the anchor of your soul for every single step the moment God's word becomes not important is the moment you're slipping slowly at first your identity starts to shake then some of the, the same dysfunctions begin to repeat and then you begin to slowly yield into the same bondage out of which you came from but today we are here to be reminded God's word attacks the devil